Divine Sack or lowercase, Drinks Coach UK or lowercase, you're watching YouTube, The Drinks Coach UK. Hit subscribe, hit on the bell if you want future uh, notifications of shows. This show's called Japan 101. Quite clever, really, because this is the 101st episode. I don't know if you saw the 100th episode, but it was quite fun. Have a look afterwards. Um, Japan, who knew that Japan made wine, right? You'd be surprised, and I know quite a lot about the subject. I recently did a talk on behalf of this group of producers in Japan uh, for a bunch of, of winos in London, and I thought, well, this is an opportunity far too good to miss. So um, here I am talking to you, you lot, about one of the most unusual and rare um, wine regions in the world, I suppose. Um, there are nearly 900 growers of grapes in Japan. Would that surprise you? Certainly surprised me. Um, about 330 of them are from one region, which we'll come to in a minute, called the Yamanashi Prefecture, um, famous for growing this grape variety. These all come from one grape variety, which is the reason why I've got them here, called Koshu. K-O-S-H-U. There we go. Koshu. Um, but to just give it a bit of a broader perspective, um, Japan obviously is a country full of beer swillers, very, very fine qualities of lager, and actually an increasingly cool um, craft beer scene. But of course there's also sake and shochu, which is distilled spirits either made from grain, from rice, uh, or often sweet potato, in fact, you know. Um, and uh, I'm quite taken by it all. Uh, the Japanese drink scene is really quite extraordinary uh, and very sophisticated. Um, but behind all of this, there was actually a wine um, business. Thanks, wife. Another, another map <laughs> taken from the computer. Up here is the island of Hokkaido. Down here is the island of Kyushu. Now, those are the two outliers of Honzu, Honzu, which is in the middle. So up here, you've got powder, amazing snow, incredible snowboarding. Uh, Sapporo, the capital of Hokkaido, was in fact a previous Winter Olympics destination. Uh, and down here, you've got an island which is like it's like Mallorca. It's beautiful Mediterranean, beautiful weather, beaches and sunshine and very warm. Uh, what's extraordinary is that they make wine up here, they make wine down here, and then they make sake all the way along here from the top to the bottom. They even uh, down here, it's particularly famous for making miso and also soy sauce. Um, but the region we're talking about today is <laughs> slap bang in the middle. If you see where it says Japan there below the p right where the foot of the p is is the center of yamanashi prefecture okay and that's the region that we're talking about today it's about a two hours drive west of tokyo the big black blob there um if you go down to nagoya there nagoya and you go to the a where the a is is mount fuji that incredible mountain uh, which you can see from almost half of Japan. Most extraordinary symmetrical mountain, which is the icon, I suppose, of Japan in terms of visualisations and famous art. And if you go just north of the P, where the Yamanashi Prefecture is, you're in the Japanese Alps, in Nagano, which is another prefecture. And the Nagano Prefecture is also where they've had a Winter Olympics. So um, you're already getting an idea that you have extremes of temperature. In summer, not only can it be southern spain hot but it can be a hundred percent humidity it can be unbelievably humid and in the winter quite naturally wonderful crisp frosty covering of snow and extraordinary skiing etc so there we go that's the geography at all um but back in about seven eight well they say seven eighteen but around the eighth century the beginning of the eighth century um along the silk route uh, a trade route that predates Europeans' influence with the Far East, predates Marco Polo and the whole Venetian Empire. Um, and a, a variety came from the Caucasus called Koshu. And Koshu was brought over there via China to Japan and arrived in Japan, we believe, at the beginning of the 8th century. Nothing really happened with it um, for a long time. Uh, and then um, as Venetian and Portuguese um, tradesmen were allowed to enter certain ports in the south, of Japan down here in Kyushu uh, and they would trade with the warlords of Kyushu they brought red wine uh, chitashu uh, which is means red booze in Japan uh, from Portugal and the warlords loved this stuff they were drinking flagons like the Hellfire Club and realized it gave you quite a nice buzz it was obviously quite good for you and the interest in wine started 
but it wasn't really again for another two or three hundred years because that happened in the 16th and 17th centuries. It didn't happen until the end of the 20th century, um, well, 19th century actually, um, that there was a, a cross pollination of ideas between one of their closest trade partners, which is France, who came over and learned about Japanese art and Japanese handcraft, uh, making of knives. Uh, Sabatien stuff was influenced by all of that. Um, but also uh, Arita ware, which is made again in the South Island, um, which um, is bone china effectively, which predates the kind of china we had in the UK by some 50 years or so. Um, but the Japanese were then taught how to make wine. And it was indeed in this little prefecture here, right in the dead centre of Japan, that Japanese winemaking was sort of born. Uh, now let's talk about five wines here that I've picked out out of a group of 10, because there's only so much time in the world, um, and I don't want to bore you to death. But these are fascinating wines, and I would love you to try one if you get the chance. Um, right, let's start off with this. So this is Lumiere Korshu Hikari. Hikari, okay. And Lumiere is owned by a Mr. Kida. Kida-san makes a sparkling out of Koshu, which I think is the reason why I've made sure that this is in the lineup. I just noticed something. Ah, really? Ah, I'm, I'm not that ADHD, but it, it was clearly something wrong there, wasn't there? Okay, um, so, um, yes, um, if you get Koshu, I mean, I'll explain the, 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 the characteristics of Koshu in a minute, but it's a very light variety and it tends to be picked at relatively low alcohols. You can make extremely good, I mean, champagne quality sparkling wine. Uh, and there is a company called Amethyst who brings in the Lumiere wines. And for about £35, I strongly urge you next time, just for a bit of fun, if it's a special birthday party, it's my birthday next weekend. Oh no, was it last weekend? <laughs> um, where we're going to have some sushi, uh, make it all Japanese. And it'd be quite nice to have a Japanese sparkling wine with it. And you must try this wine. Lumiere sparkling or pétillant koshu is very, very tasty and very good indeed. And a wine that has such leanness and transparency, the process of making it into a sparkling wine with the tiny bubbles and the yeast overlay really increases the amplitude and richness of the drink. And it's lovely. Um, so starting off with Lumiere, they also have an incredible in, uh, French restaurant in the Amanashi prefecture, which I strongly recommend you go to. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I ate a wonderful lunch there with my wife once. Okay, so moving on, uh, we've got Haramo as well. We better taste these wines actually. Um, Haramo, um, Haramo-san has this incredible, beautiful old coffee shop, tea shop. I think it used to be a congregational building, huge um, kind of pagoda with a massive iron bell outside for calling the locals together. Uh, and it's so beautiful and so um, uh, so liked as a destination for social gatherings that even just to go upstairs and have a cup of tea and a can of Coke, you have to kind of ring three or four weeks in advance to get your table. Um, uh, one thing I didn't know um, when I met Mr. Haramo is his love for Led Zeppelin. Yes, the original metal rockers, Led Zeppelin, Robert Plant. He looks like Jimmy Page. He's got a short grey cut bob, same glasses. And I believe he even bought in an auction one of Jimmy Page's GS1 uh, Gibson guitars for some bucket of money. And he plays in a tribute band and does a load of covers on Led Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin. Um, so shout out to you my friend um, we had lots of time talking about Zeppelin and Pink Floyd uh, the founding fathers of rock and roll well modern rock anyway um, so let's try these wines this one here um, classic Koshu the, the nose is delicate this is quite a cool year 2019 in warmer years there's more tropical well, I say tropical more Mediterranean fruits more tangerine more melon more uh, I don't know peach stone fruits this wine has a definite smell of crab apple and crunch about it. Almost rhubarb, but not that green quite. Um, so delicate and so clean. Very, very light, these wines. By the time you've got them from Japan, they're no longer the 2,200 yen, sort of 12, 13 pounds they would be in Japan. I'm afraid they've doubled in price. So it is a bit of a curiosity up to a point. But if you're having Japanese food, they're actually absolutely extraordinary. And there are certain things that I do eat where I'm trying to find the right match for it. And one of them was oysters. If you drink one, if you eat lovely English oysters or oysters from the British Isles or even France, which obviously have fantastic oysters too, 
we've got to remember that the rock oyster, the Yokohama oyster, actually was reintroduced into Europe from um, the Pacific Ocean around Japan. And we've got them to thank for the fact that we have rock oysters at all, because they were almost eaten by poor people into extinction. Um, and you think about like sparkling wine, sometimes champagne works very well with oysters. And you think, oh, that's something a bit lighter. Maybe I'll try some sherry. Well, that's quite rich. And then you have a muscadet, which is lovely with oysters. It's briny, but it's still quite powerful. And you just think, is there something lower, more delicate, more perfect for oysters than that? Yes. Koshi of Japan. This is the ultimate wine. The ultimate wine with oysters, ladies and gentlemen. Um, good to know, right? So... Uh, we're going to go on to Haramo, which is slightly riper. This wine was coming in at about 11% alcohol. This is just knocking over 11 and a half, so it's getting up towards 12, more than normal levels of a very, very light northern French white, maybe. We need an English wine. Oh, I forgot how much punch there is there. It's got a lovely, sour, almost cider crab apple tannin to it, crunchy. Hint of quince. Toothsome. I always like that wine. And it's getting better every year. Um, he gets my tip for most improved big brand in uh, Yamanashi over the last 10 years that I've been tasting these wines. Coming on to Ayana's beautiful wine. Ayana, Ayana, Ayana Misawa. Um, they have a... Uh, a wine library which has it's the largest collection of books both fictional and non-fiction I've ever seen on the subject of wine uh, even has children's books on teaching people about wine in there and it's a wonderful place you can, I could well many many hours in um, and her father fourth generation producer here at Grace Grace Vineyards there we go it's a beautiful delicate label almost like parchment uh, and this is the private reserve which is the second up in their range um, and uh, Ayana, um, who I think studied, I think she studied winemaking in UC Davis in California. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure she's American trained. And um, she is an extraordinarily good wine um, winemaker uh, and also an absolute sweetheart. She's just such an adorable lady. Charming, like you wouldn't believe. Very pretty. She gave um, my wife this gorgeous pale, kind of plum pale silk scarf to welcome us to. Uh, yeah, I mean, actually, which I thought was way beyond the call of uh, duty, and uh, we we adore Ayana. So thank you very much again. Um, this wine, these wines, in order to get some of their weight up, they tend to be aged what we call surely. I mean, this one here has got a rather Portuguese label, just to show you the influence of Portuguese on on some of the producers. Um, they're aged on their lees. That means the dead yeast cells that are left behind and left in the bottom of the tank to give the wine a richness and a and a and a, and a broadness. Um, Speaking to Ayana and her father, they say they flatly absolutely do not do that with grace. The wine is fermented, it's, it's racked off the, the yeast cells, which can cause uh, a bit of unfocus in the wine, um, a bit, bit of nutty spice. They want to keep the fruit super, super pure. And so um, these wines tend to stand out in, in a crowd of, of Koshu because they seem to be the only people that have the confidence to let the fruit sing on its own. And it... I know they don't like to compare each other to each other in the group, but largely speaking, when you go see people go into a large tasting and come back out, Grace is often the one that most people enjoyed or thought had something a bit different about it. And there is another reason for that. The way the grapes are grown is on huge vines. The vine comes out of the ground, maybe 60, 70 years old, and then it's made into an umbrella which is on this big pergola terrace. So you can literally stand underneath and pick the grapes. But it means that the grapes are protected from the fierce heat. Um, it means there's more wind coming through, so they're protected from the mildew and rot, from all this humidity that happens in summer. Um, but they have this weird pergola trellis, which is common. Now, um, the Mizawa family at Grace decided that actually with modern technology and modern pesticides and, and with, with more understanding, not necessarily even using pesticides or maybe even going to a more organic approach to things, that if you use proper European trellising, where you have the, all of the vines in a row kind of like grown to T-shapes with all the canes facing up in straight lines, which we call vertical shoot positioning vsp trellis um this is how the, almost all the wines in the world are grown modernly these days that what they found was it was reducing the yields of the vines but incredibly in increasing the concentration of fruit so um because they use vsp uh, in most of their wines these wines stand out as being lower in yield hence you have to put the price up a bit because you're making less of it but you know much more concentrated wines uh. Grace always has this smell, this faint smell. I don't know if it's just psychosomatic 
of Japanese plum, of ume, of yellow plum, um, of violet. There's a florality to it. Um, really terrific wine. Um, if you want to chance your arm at around £20 or just over, um, do get in touch with Hallgarten or any of the independent wine merchants that might stock this and try some Grace Koshu. Just puts a smile on your face. What can I say? It has joy in that wine, and it's just so sunny, the distribution of the wine. Okay, so two more to go. 15 minutes in. Um, the eagle-eyed of you, I know somebody noticed this the other day, noticed that I had a bottle on the shelf, had it for many, many, many shows. Chateau Mer Chan, 2011, Gris de Gris, which is, in fact, this wine, eight years before. And this is the new label. It says, Koshu, Ferfuku, Furfuki District, Yamanashi, Japan, Gris de Gris. <laughs> well, what is it? Because this is a different wine and fascinating. In the same way that Mr. Kida is making extraordinary champagne quality sparkling wines, thinking outside the box with this delicate wine, thinking of ways that would appeal to a much larger European or cosmopolitan audience. The people at Chateau Merchan, one of the one million bottle producers of Koshu, it's quite a big business, incredibly modern, amazing science there, one of the best consistent producers of wines of all quality. Uh, they make Chardonnays that cost £50, that have won gold medals in the International Wine Challenge. So uh, I'm from Nagano in the, uh, in the Alps. Um, so they are capable of making all sorts of extraordinary wines. Um, and uh, the, the wine here is called Gris de Gris for a reason. Koshu grapes are purple. I mean, very, very, very faint lilac pink purple. There's a purpley hue to them. Um, no, almost almost like a... It's hard to think of something. It, they look like a Cotswold leg bar egg. There's a bluish, purplish pastel hue to the, to the grapes. So the grapes aren't, in of themselves, white grapes. If you actually use the skins in the wine, it comes out pink. And they went, well, if it's a pink variety, why the hell isn't anyone making a pink wine? So, hence... Gris de Gris, which is shortcut in French of pink from pink grapes. Now, if you get red grapes and squeeze them, like in, China, in, in, in champagne production, like Pinot Meunier, the juice inside most red grapes is pale white. It's white inside. It's just red on the skin. So you're making a white wine. This is called Blanc de Noir, making a white wine from red grapes or black grapes. Um, you can do the other way around. Because when you make red wine, what you have to do is you have to get the grapes and put them in the wine while it's fermenting. The wine starts to turn to alcohol and the, it's the alcohol that leaches the colour out of the skins and then your wine turns from red, of white to red. Um, so if you have white grapes with green skins and you put them into a wine and you let, leave the skins in there and do a, what we call a skin ferment, you end up with a wine that we now lovingly call amber wine or yellow wine or orange wine, take your pick. And Gris de Gris is the first that I know of orange wine made from Koshu. And Koshu being a very delicate light wine, and these guys being wizzos at what they do, this wine's got slightly more alcohol, it's about 12, 12.5%. But by aging the wines on the skins, you end up with this wonderful, decent golden glow. Now it looks much more like Chardonnay, this stuff. When you smell it, it's got this beautiful fuzzy apricot nose to it. And when you taste it, just like with red grapes, when you make red wine, it gives a little bit of a tannin dryness to the wine, which makes this wine exceptionally interesting with food. This is fantastic with things like barbecued pork belly. I, I had a particularly fun night eating unagi, freshwater eel, uh, slathered in um, in um, a brown miso or red miso, and then put over a very, very hot robotaki grill. I mean, oh, Japanese food's so delicious. Um, so here we are, Chateau chan Gris de Gris. Um, an orange wine made in Japan, and again, not crazy money. I think you can get this for just a shade over £20. Genuinely worth the pennies. Very, very interesting wine. And let's bring it on to, historically, the last wine I wanted to show you today. Can you see what it says at the top? You might notice. Or at the bottom, even. What's that, What's that word at the bottom? Suntory. Top. Suntory. Tomino Oka. Winery. <laughs> and it's a winery that was built in 1912 and is a winery where a company decided to start making alcoholic drinks. This is ground zero for one of the world's largest whiskey companies. Suntory was a 6,000 bottle a year, tiny koshu producer a hundred years ago in a slightly, in a tiny corner, very high up in the mountains, a place called Kai City. And they were making... Koshu. 
Just simple white wine, as well as they knew how. One thing led to another. They realised that not only was there an interest in European wine, but there's also an interest in European whiskey. And they produced a, a distillery. I think Yamazaki came first, then more locally to the Yamanashi Prefecture, prefecture the Hakshu um, distillery. And now Hibiki Suntory Whiskey 17 is £500 for half a litre. Crikey, what happened? Uh, Japanese whiskey can be extraordinarily good. I'm a massive fan. Very popular drink over there. Now, what's so special about this? Well, you're in a beautiful site, very high up, overlooking Corfu City. The views are stellar with the view of Mount Fuji in the distance. This wine has been aged on lees and 30% of the wine has been aged in large barrels. Probably inert barrels, not too much flavour, but to add the, a richness and roundness to the wine, some of this wine has seen some wood. So you've got wood and a little bit of barrel ferment, you've got lees to increase the texture further, you've got ripeness, high altitude, more texture. So generally speaking, this is a fantastically consistent wine. And in 2019, quite by surprise to me, by the way, I rated this my favourite wine of all the, um, the sort of standard release cashews from 2019. So cheers to Santori. Uh, send me some whiskey, please. Uh, and uh, I just want to say... Kampai, and thank you very much to all the um, help that I've had from Koshu of Japan, uh, from Phipps PR, uh, and uh, yeah, drink some Japanese wine, you might be surprised. See you next time.